All life on Earth develops thanks to the interaction that occurs between the environment and its living beings, as well as the relationship that are established between different species. In this The Daily Eco video, we explain one of these relationships, symbiosis. In addition, we explain the types that there are and we give you some examples to better understand them. Let's get started. Symbiosis in Ecology and Biology We can define symbiosis as the relationship of coexistence that is established at an ecological level between two individuals of different species that are in direct contact with each other with the objective of obtaining a certain benefit. The two organisms involved in this type of relationship are called symbionts, or if they're in different sizes, the largest is called a host and the smallest a symbiont. Symbiotic relationships are very important in the environment as they enable many species to survive. This is why we consider that symbiosis works as an enhancer of the evolution of these species, which manage to improve their way of life by establishing relationships with other organisms. Types of symbiosis on the one hand, depending on the costs and benefits obtained by the species involved, they can be classified into mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Mutual relationships are those in which the two organisms involved obtain benefits. On the other hand, commensalism occurs when one of the species benefits from the other, but doesn't harm the other. Lastly, parasitism occurs when one of the species, called a parasite, benefits at the expense of the other and therefore does cause harm. Before we continue, let's check if you have understood with an example. If a bird is located in a tree and building a nest among its branches, what kind of symbiotic relationship do these two beings have? Is it A. Mutualism, B. Commensalism, or C. Parasitism? Think about it because at the end of the video, we'll tell you if you're right. On the other hand, depending on whether one of the symbionts lives inside the other or not, they can be classified into endosymbiosis or ectosymbiosis. It's endosymbiosis if the organism lives inside the cells of the other symbiont or in the gaps between them. On the other hand, it is ectosymbiosis if the symbiont can survive on the outside of the host cells. For example, it can be found on the surface of the digestive tract, exocrine glands, or externally on their body. In addition, they can also be classified as mandatory when the relationship is necessary for one of the participants to survive, and optional when the relationship benefits at least one of the organisms, but it's not necessary for it to survive. Lastly, depending on the way in which this relationship has been established, a distinction can be made between the symbiotic relationships of vertical transmission when the symbionts are transmitted to the offspring, or the symbiotic relationships of horizontal transmission when the host organism obtains its symbiont from the environment generation after generation. Examples of symbiosis here are some examples of symbiosis so that you can better understand the importance of these types of relationships for the survival of these organisms. Ants and aphids Some species of ants, such as the black ant, protect herds of aphids that in return provide them with food and honeydew, a sugary substance that they produce rich in carbohydrates. Crocodiles and plovers We all know the great power that crocodiles have in their jaws. The downside of their 80 teeth is that food debris can cause serious problems such as infections. Thus arises the relationship with the Egyptian plovers, who obtain their food by cleaning the remains that they find between the teeth of the crocodiles. And this is how crocodiles avoid oral issues by allowing plovers to move inside of their mouths in search for food debris. Sharks and Remoras This is the clearest case of commensalism and it occurs between these two animals. Surely you have seen little fish swimming under sharks. Well, these fish attach themselves to the sharks and obtain protection and nourishment from the remains of the food that they don't eat and even eat the parasites of the sharks, leaving the shark squeaky clean and unbothered by parasites or food remains. Clownfish and anemone These fish carry out their entire life inside the anemones, which are very poisonous. They establish a mutualistic relationship in which the clownfish attracts other predatory fish that when they come into contact with the anemone are paralyzed and served as food, the remains of which the clownfish uses. Lichens. These are symbiotic associations between a fungus and an algae. 
The fungus protects the algae from dehydration and provides it with a structure on which to grow, and the algae makes carbohydrates that the fungus can use as food. Finally, we have the intestinal flora and the microbiota. In our intestine, as well as in many other parts of our body, there are large numbers of bacteria and other microorganisms that live in symbiosis with our cells. These are of great importance for our health to such an extent that variations in this microbiota can cause alterations in our body. And going back to the question we have asked you before, have you thought about it? The bird and the tree are a clear example of commensalism, since the bird benefits from the shelter that the tree provides without harming it. We hope you enjoyed this The Daily Eco video and we'll see you in the next one.